Welcome to our live webcast, ESP in Serratus Plain Blocks for Thoracic Trauma Webinar. Thank you for joining us. My name is Elizabeth Smith, and I'm the Membership Manager for ASRA, and will be the host for tonight's webinar. We are joined tonight by our moderator, Mark Leonard, CAA at Team Health in Trinity, Florida, and Assistant Professor at Nova Southeastern University in Tampa, who is going to introduce tonight's topic and speakers. Welcome, Mark. Good evening, everybody, or good morning, or good night, depending on where you are from the in the world. So thank you very much, Sarah, for the introduction. Um, my name is Mark Leonard. Um, I'll be working alongside Dr. Reed Nelson tonight in this uh, in this industry-sponsored webinar. So we want to say a huge thank you to ASRA and to Payunk for asking us to do this talk for you all this evening. And we're going to concentrate on, on two hot topic blocks at the moment in serratus anterior plane and erector spinae. So... Um, I want to ask you if you have any questions during the presentation, if you could use the question and answer box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please don't type questions into the chat block box. Please use the Q&A box um, and we will answer those questions at the end of the presentation. Feel free to chat throughout the presentation. So the chat and the Q&As will be monitored. Um, and yeah, without further ado, we will... Uh, Sarah, if you could let me share my screen. Okay. While I'm waiting for Sarah to stop her screen, uh, I'm just going to introduce Dr. Nelson for you. So Dr. Nelson's a board certified anesthesiologist at the Dixie Regional Medical Center in St. George, Utah. He's currently the Associate Medical Director of Acute Pain Services and Obstetric Anesthesia for Intermountain Healthcare. And as a partner for Mountain West Anesthesia, he serves on the Board of Managers as the Chief Information Officer. Dr. Nelson also volunteers his time as the Medical Director for the Dixie State University Respiratory Therapy Program, and he enjoys working with the respiratory therapy students. He's the Director of Anesthesia for the Texas Podiatric Medical Foundation, and he enjoys going to San Miguel, Mexico every year to provide nerve blocks and anesthesia for their medical missions. He's the founding partner of a healthcare software company called RX Check-In, and is currently on the company's Physician Advisory Board. Dr. Nelson grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah, but he now enjoys living close to Zion's National Park in Southern Utah. He and his wife have five children with the two oldest girls studying at the University of Utah. He loves fly fishing and his three boys, with his three boys and his dog, Charlie. So Sarah, I can't share my screen as whilst yours open. Thank you. Now, one second. I'm sorry, everybody. We had done a dry run on our presentation, which meant that I would have been sharing my screen with you um, on the last slide of our presentation, which you really aren't here to see. You really do want to we see go backwards. the first slide. Oh, we... <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody. So, thank you. Um, again, yeah, I jumped on the chat earlier to see where people were from and you know all across America people in the UK where I know it's midnight over there you can tell from my accent that I was once from America um, Australia Serbia Hong Kong Mexico so thank you for joining us and I really do hope that you get something out of this presentation I'm going to speak um, about serratus anterior plane blocks with you first of all uh, and my experience of those and then I'm going to hand over the floor to Dr Nelson who will run over ESP blocks with you and then we will answer those Q&As which I can see coming in at the same time. So um, why are we talking about these blocks? Well uh, predominantly because of chest wall trauma so this is what we're going to concentrate on a lot tonight, uh, rib fractures chest wall trauma and the high mortality rate that these injuries carry. 
Um, most of these are largely due to the extreme pain that the patients are under. And for those of you that deal in a trauma environment with patients with multiple rib fractures will know those patients don't want to breathe. They don't want to take big inspiratory volumes. And because of that, that, help, that promotes atelectasis and it puts these patients at a high risk of getting hospital acquired pneumonias. That's not good for those patients. And especially if your patients are from the older age bracket or have got underlying respiratory um, pathology, and that creates a problem. And traditionally we would treat these patients using combination therapies, including opioids, thoracic epidurals, intercostal blocks, but there's problems associated with those as we know. Um, high dose opioids cause respiratory depression, which further um, exasperates the effects of the patients not breathing. Sedative effects, which again causes dyspnea and dyspnea and then possibly apnea, hypotension. And if the patients are anticoagulated, that creates a problem with any of our central neuroaxial blocks. So the erector spinny plane block and the serratus anterior block are simple blocks which can offer you equal analgesia with fewer side effects. So the reason that we're doing this presentation for you today is Pionka releasing um, the fifth poster in their range of free posters. This poster covers regional anesthesia for thoracic trauma, and we can see that serratus anterior plane, erector spinae, thoracic paravertebral, and thoracic epidural blocks are featured within that poster. If you'd like to inquire about that poster, there is an email address at the bottom. I will post that email address in the chat panel, and we will put it up on one of the slides further in the presentation. So the serratus anterior plane block. I couldn't teach you a faster block if I wanted to. This is a very straightforward block, practiced in a lot of ED centers and works fantastically well. So what is it used for? It's a fascial plane block. It's considerably safer than trying to place a thoracic epidural or a paravertebral block. Um, used for thoracic surgery, breast surgery, surgery in the axilla, which can tie in with thoracic surgery for axillary node dissections. Rib fractures, predominantly lateral wall fractures, and chest strain analgesia. And these are all indications where I would insert a serratus plane block into a patient. So, what nerves are we blocking is a question that's quite often apt. Well, the main nerves we're covering are the lateral cutaneous branches of the intercostal nerves from T2 to T12 predominantly. Um, again, depending on the area of the block, the volumes of local use, then the other three nerves that can be caught are the thoracodorsal nerve, the long thoracic nerve, and the intercostal nerves, all supplying different innovation to the different muscle layers that we're talking about. Where do we perform it? So mid-axillary line. If I had a model and an ultrasound probe here now, I would tell you to take the probe in your hand, pass it into the mid-axillary line, and you would pretty much be seeing the image that you want to see from that. So overlying the fourth rib, it's very easy to identify the muscular anatomy there. And that also will give you a good indication to place the needle and get good posterior spread of that local anesthetic. Now, when do you perform it? Well, it's very easy to insert. So if you're not confident in inserting a paravertebral block or when Dr. Nelson talks to you about erector spinae plane blocks, you think, mm, I'm not ready at that level yet, then maybe using the serratus plane block as an adjunct, as an alternative with multimodal analgesia will be sufficient for you. It's got a very good safety profile. So again, that falls in the, a learning block category. You avoid a sympathetic block. So of course that has its advantages. It can be performed in the presence of abnormal coagulation. So a patient's got uh, abnormal coagulation, uh, comes in as a trauma patient with bleeding issues, and this is a very safe and fast block to perform. And the patient does not need to be sat or rolled laterally to perform any blocks on the posterior side of the anatomy. So if the patient's immobilized with a neck collar and on a spinal board, you can still perform a serratus plane block on that patient. So it has great advantages where that patient cannot be mobilized. Now you could perform a serratus block, send the patient for CT. When the neck comes back clear uh, and you know that you can safely either sit or roll the patient into the lateral position, and then you may want to progress with an erector spinae plane block after that. So how do you perform it? Pretty much take the probe in the transverse plane and pop it into the mid axillary line at the fourth to fifth rib level. It's a very straightforward block. So at the level of the nipple, scan from the anterior surface, posteriorly into the mid axillary line, and we will see the ultrasound image on the right hand side of the screen. 
Um, there's quite often some little blood vessels in there underneath the latissimus dorsi muscle, which are good indicators. So they are branches of the thoracodorsal artery. And this is what we should see. And I've got some videos to show you in a second. They're about 40 seconds long, which is exactly how quick it is to find the anatomy for this block. So we're starting slightly anteriorly. We can move from a pectoralis um, area and scan our probe lateral posterior into the mid axillary line and what we will see is the latissimus dorsi muscle coming in now i describe it as a wedge a door stop or a rocket coming into the screen it's very easy to visualize below the latissimus dorsi is serratus anterior running across the top of the ribs we can see the fifth rib in this image here and the intercostal muscles running in between those ribs with pleura beneath when we see the video, it's very easy to see that pleura um, is, is visible and we can see the pleura moving. Unless we're in, in this block for a chest strain insertion, for example, where there may be a pneumothorax, so obviously check to see if pleura is there before and after your block. Now, it's a relatively superficial block as well, so we're not going deep with our needle. And basically, we're going to place it into this fascial plane beneath latissimus dorsi. So we don't want a, a big 90 degree insertion angle with our needle. And if we carefully insert our needle from the anterior approach, we should use the rib as a buffer. So we can have the rib in an in-plane approach. It also lends itself to an out-of-plane approach, but I do practice them in-plane. This is also a fantastic block for indwelling nerve catheters. And by inserting a nerve catheter, we would need to go an in-plane approach. So here we're going to just watch a short video um, of the scanning for the region. So we can see we're starting off already in the mid-axillary line. And we are going to just move our ultrasound probe posterior until we come into the mid-axillary line. And we can see a rib, two ribs, three ribs pleura beneath the ribs, the intercostals, and we see that latissimus dorsi muscle come straight into that image. Serratus underneath that, and the ribs and the intercostals in between. We can see the small blood vessels if we put color Doppler on, which we should always do, ensuring that we stay away from these vessels. Now, under hydro dissection, the vessels will collapse and move out the way. So we're going to have our needle from an anterior approach coming from the right hand side of the screen into this fascial plane. When we inject into there, we expect to see latissimus dorsi and serratus move apart from each other and we are injecting into that fascial plane. If you hydro dissect as you as you move into that space, hydro dissect your needle, you will get better posterior spread and more coverage. So a male patient next. Slightly different anatomy in the respect that um, he has a, a larger serratus muscle. So again, scanning mid axillary line, there's that latissimus dorsi coming in. We can see those two thoracodorsal vessels, two ribs, pleura below moving very nicely, intercostal muscles, needle into this space. Remembering it's a high volume, low concentration nerve block as with most of our fascial plane blocks. So maybe 30 cc's, you can perform this block bilaterally for bilateral rib fractures or bilateral surgeries. I do this block for all of my bilateral mastectomies and reconstructions. Um, so higher volumes, lower concentration block. So in summary, that's my part. Why would we do this? Well, it's so easy to perform. Take the probe, mid axillary line, look for latissimus dorsi, inject below it, and above serratus. It has a very good safety profile when ultrasound used correctly. The biggest warning sign for this is to make sure that you stay away from the blood vessels. So use color Doppler, aspirate and inject very carefully. It can be performed supine. So we don't need to reposition our patient. So let's say that our surgery extended and we thought that this had good efficacy for pain relief for this block. We could do that while the patient's asleep and supine. Um, it does not cause an autonomic block, so there's minimal side effects on the patient's blood pressure. So if we're worried about that, it's very straightforward. It's a low concentration, high volume block. So please, for all of these blocks, make sure you calculate your maximum doses per your patient's weight. 
and it's an excellent block to cite a nerve catheter and the Pionk um, E catheter is a fantastic catheter to use in this. It's as fast as doing that single shot block. It positions very, very well and that catheter can stay in for several days and give good, good pain relief. So that's my little blurb on the serratus anterior plane block. Um, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Nelson, who's going to talk to us about the erector spinoplane block. Great. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. That was a great uh, introduction and, and explanation of the uh, serratus plane block. Today, uh, we're going to continue on with the erector spinae block. And uh, this block has been used for uh, multiple reasons, and it's, it's quickly becoming uh, more popular, uh, mainly because of the uh, re lower side effects and the ease of placement. Go ahead and go to the next slide if you wouldn't mind, Mark. It is, a, again, a fascial plane block and it, uh, because of its uh, safer profile, it has become an alternative to thoracic epidurals and paravertebral blocks. We commonly use this and are being asked to place this block uh, for chest wall trauma, especially for uh, multiple rib fractures and uh, we're going to the ICU for, um, to place these blocks, either surgical um, uh, cases where they're gonna be plating these ribs or uh, non-surgical. Uh, we've been asked, uh, they're becoming so popular that the, the trauma surgeons are asking for those uh, either way. We also do these for major breast reconstruction surgeries, uh, major mastectomies. It's a bilateral block, but it, it seems to last a little longer than uh, the uh, PEX block and uh, the, uh, just the local infusion or injections that the surgeons are using. Uh, a more recent uh, trend has been our heart surgeons and thoracic surgeons have been asking for these blocks. Uh, we did one uh, a little while ago and uh, for a patient postoperatively that was uh, struggling with pain. And uh, one of our docs said, hey, yeah, let's try this for the um, uh, uh, sternotomy. It works so well that now our surgeons are asking for all their uh, sternotomies and, and their thoracotomies to have this block. Uh, and, and you're also seeing some uh, major upper abdominal surgeries that will um, uh, work for this, this block as well. Uh, some of your bariatric surgeries and, um, and, and are, are very popular, uh, are becoming more popular with the, a lower erector spinae block. Next slide. Oh, there we go. Uh, this is a local anesthesia uh, that you can typically use for the erector spinae block. There's multiple options here, but uh, I'll, I'll kind of tell you how, uh, how I approach this. Uh, again, I'd like to emphasize that these are ma ma uh, maximum doses. So if you're doing bilateral blocks, you have to include this uh, in, in all your injection uh, sites. Quarter percent bupivacaine, uh, I would say 20 to 60 cc's. Again, if you're going to inject 60 cc's, you need to make sure that uh, it is a larger person and it falls within the uh, local anesthesia systemic toxicity dosing. A quarter percent or 0.2 percent ropivacaine uh, may be not last quite as long as bupivacaine, but is also very uh, advantageous for those who are um, uh, compromised with some other morbidities that may not tolerate as much bupivacaine. Like Mark said, perineurial catheters are uh, easily placed in this block as well and, and can be placed uh, for multiple days. Uh, you know, we've had thoracic epidurals in for a week to 10 days, and uh, we typically only have five days for a, a peripheral nerve block, but it is possible to have them in uh, with good sterile technique for a little bit longer if, if needed. Uh, you can also place multiple nerve catheters. If you have a, a rib fractures, from, if you have rib fractures from T2 to T10, uh, one uh, a nerve catheter uh, may not be sufficient and you may need to add one at uh, T2 or T4 and, and one at T8 to cover all the, those uh, rib fractures. Liposomal bupivacaine is an, a good option for this as well. Uh, it typically will give you anywhere from 48 to 72 hours. Uh, and if you need to um, uh, make that a little uh, higher dosing, you can mix that with a quarter percent bupivacaine. I do like having some supplements in there, uh, epinephrine or uh, dexmedetomidine, uh, and because they will give you a few extra hours uh, if you're going to do just a single injection. 
Next slide. Uh, so this is where do we pre perform it? And I, I went into a little bit of this before, but uh, typically in the thoracic and lumbar vertebral areas, uh, again, you want if you have rib fractures, you kind of want to go in the middle. Uh, the fascial plane uh, is below the erector spinae muscle and above uh, or, or posterior to the uh, transverse process. This is a high volume injection, low concentration. And, and remember, you want to go at least, um, if you have rib fractures, you want to kind of go in the middle of that. So T, T4 or T2 through T6, you'll want to go right in the middle at T4. Uh, and that will get two levels cephalad and two levels caudad, typically, uh, with a 20 to 30 mill, milliliter uh, injection. Uh, and, uh, and again, it may require more than one level to inject, to cover all those fractures or cover all that surgical site. Uh, bilateral uh, blocks are required for uh, mastectomies and sternotomies. And uh, this block, because it's a fascial plane block, uh, we oftentimes perform this uh, under general anesthesia. But it doesn't necessarily have to be. It's not a painful block to place. Uh, awake patients tolerate this very well. If you're doing a, a, like, a bilateral mastectomy, We'll do it before surgery to give it time uh, and use it as part of a multimodal analgesia uh, regimen. Next slide, please. Uh, when do you perform this block? We get a, a phone call uh, all the time from our trauma surgeons asking us to come to the ICU and perform this block. Uh, it can be, formed on, uh, be performed on an intubated patient if you need to or uh, uh, preoperatively on an awake patient. Uh, it should be part of a multimodal analgesia regimen, uh, especially for painful surgeries. And, and I would recommend it performed preoperatively in order to make, allow it to set up uh, in, in the postoperative period. Uh, we're not so concerned about anticoagulation in these patients uh, as we are with thoracic epidurals and paravertebral blocks. Uh, it's not uh, as, as worrisome because you are uh, able to stay away from that paravertebral space and, and the epidural space. It's not, like Mark said, this block is also not going to drop your uh, blood pressure very much, if at all, and uh, you can perform this block on hemodynamically unstable uh, trauma patients. And you can use this, like we said, for uh, uh, long-term opioid sparing uh, pain management uh, options, uh, five, six, seven days, even 10 days if needed. Uh, why do we use the ESP block? It's similar, similar analgesia profile as the uh, thoracic epidural and paravertebral blocks, but it is, uh, seems to be a much safer block. Like I said, you don't have the drop in blood pressure or the sympathetic autonomic uh, uh, drop, and uh, you can perform this block over uh, multiple uh, vertebral levels without need of blood pressure support. Anticoagulated patients, and it seems to be easier to place uh, than the thoracic epidural and paravertebral block. Mark mentioned this before, so I'll go over quickly. This does, uh, rib fractures and chest wall trauma does have a significant increase in your mortality. And by blocking these, you can improve your tidal volumes, improve your incentive uh, spirometry volumes, and decrease your pneumonia morbidity. Uh, you will also see a significant increase in patient and, and surgeon satisfaction. Uh, not only because you have good pain management, but because of the ease uh, of placement. Next slide, please. Key steps when I perform this block, I, I prefer the sitting position, uh, but it can be performed in the lateral position. Uh, if we, uh, I like to scan and mark the anatomical landmarks, so the, uh, the spinous process uh, to know what level we're at. And then I start in the lateral position and go from lateral ribs and move medial uh, it's about two to three centimeters lateral to uh, the spinous process. And, uh, and, and you want to look for the change in the bony structure from the rib to the transverse process. The rib being a kind of a round uh, bony structure, the transverse process having a flat, uh, very flat top to it. Clean and prep the skin appropriately. And I also use an in-plane approach. And I prefer that because I think you can uh, guide your needle much better. Uh, aim, I aim the needle to the corner tip of the transverse process uh, just because it helps 
uh, get that into the fascial plane. If you hit the transverse process, which is probably recommended, then I would come back maybe one millimeter and then and try your injection there. That tends to be uh, allow your uh, fascial plane to open up with that uh, injecting. I'll inject and you'll watch the erector spinae muscle peel away from that transverse process. Aspirate every five uh, milliliters. And uh, again, it's a low concentration, high volume block. So you're gonna be injecting at least 20 mLs uh, per injection. And here we'll watch the video and we'll kind of talk through the video. It's a little bit longer than Mark. So uh, we'll kind of walk through a little bit of this uh, video and, and uh, this is my son. Uh, he's very thin and, and a very good candidate for uh, this. Most of your uh, patients won't be like this. So, uh, um, but uh, he does have pretty good anatomy. The first thing I'll do is you'll notice he's in the sitting position and uh, I'll, I'll, as I place the ultrasound probe just in the paraspinal process, uh, section, you'll see that uh, you can see the transverse process really easily. Go ahead and mark uh, his uh, spinous processes at C7, T1, uh, T2, uh, T3, T4, and T5. The majority of our breast cancer or breast reconstruction surgeries are, are performed at the T4, T5 area. In fact, uh, a lot of our rib fractures are also performed there because we want, uh, we'll get some T2 fractures all the way down to T6. And so we'll typically perform a block in the T4, T5 position. You'll notice I want to start laterally here. Uh, I identify the rib. Uh, there's the rib right there. You'll see pleural lining, which is the glistening uh, kind of uh, uh, as, it, as you breathe in and out, you'll see the glistening of the pleural lining. You'll see the flat rib there and the muscles over the rib. And as, as you notice, you'll also see the shadow. The bone uh, is typically a, a bright white line and a, and a bone shadow underneath on ultrasound. And that's how you can identify both the rib and the um, transverse process. Now here I'll go uh, start moving medial and you wanna look at the transition from that rib structure to the transverse process of, uh, and, and you'll see the erector spinae muscles come into, uh, into view here too. So right there, we'll see the erector spinae muscle uh, just above the, the flat, you'll see a really flat transverse process right there, and that band of erector spinae muscle right above that. Here's the top of the erector spinae muscle, and then you see those longitudinal striations. Because that erector spinae muscle is, is going along the uh, in plane to the uh, transducer. There's the bottom of the erector spinae muscle, and that go ahead and, and, and identify this uh, transverse process with the shadow. You want to identify the erector spinae muscle, and you want to identify the uh, pleural lining right down in here, you know, obviously avoiding that as much as possible. And I use an in-plane approach, and I'll come up uh, into the corner. You'll see uh, my approach here in just a minute. But this erector spinae muscle uh, is very well visualized uh, above that transverse process. And <clears throat> as you come in, you'll uh, come in from the, the side. And I always start uh, um, cephalad and come down. And I just prefer that uh, and I find it easier. Here, that's will be the direction of the needle. And I'll go in and hit that transverse process. Maybe if I, if I can inject at that transverse process initially, I'll come back about a millimeter, and that seems to be right in that fascial plane. Uh, that bottom of that uh, trans or the erector spinae muscle and just over that transverse process. And you'll see that muscle peel away from that transverse process, and that injectate will go uh, cephalad and caudat, which uh, indicates you're getting a, a good block. Now the uh, local anesthesia will uh, spread underneath uh, uh, and, and get into possibly the paravertebral space uh, and, and spread caught out and cephalad to, to cover the dorsal and the, and the ventral uh, rami uh, spinal nerves. And if you're gonna do multiple injections uh, because of uh, multiple rib fractures, you'll want to come down here. And I wanna show you 
the the more posterior or the more caudad uh, version of the rector spinae muscle or rector spinae block. Uh, we start lateral again, identify the ner the the rib, uh, and then move medial. The rector spinae muscle down here is much thicker than up in the in the T4 T5 area, and you'll see good lateral striations here. You see the bottom uh, fascial plane of of the rector spinae muscle, and you can go ahead and uh, take your needle and go uh, uh, in plane approach and, and do the exact same thing. Inject uh, local anesthesia, again, a high volume, low concentration. Uh, and you'll also want to witness, you know, make sure you're looking for the, uh, the pleural lining, uh, which is about a centimeter away from where we're actually injecting. So it's very safe. And, and straightforward block. And then if, you, if you're if you doing bilateral blocks, you'll need to switch both sides. Uh, and uh, again, if you're doing bilateral multiple rib fractures, you'll have to do both sides in two different locations. So you just need to make sure that you're given the right amount of local anesthesia. You don't wanna use all your local anesthesia in one spot if you have to uh, give multiple injections. Here's a couple still uh, pictures. Uh, just to show the, the trapezius and the rhomboid muscles on the left, uh, you'll see the needle go through those and then the ESP uh, or rector spinae uh, muscle right there and the transverse process is about three and a half centimeters deep. You'll see my needle just at the edge of that and as uh, after I injected is on the right hand side and you'll see local anesthesia that has spread above the transverse process and below the uh, erector spinae muscle. That dark fluid is the is the injecting uh, from from that injection of the of the ESP below the ESP uh, fascial plane. Next slide, please. This is uh, a couple more pictures. I just wanted to show the bone shadow here and the erector spinae muscle uh, is very prominent here, and you can um, identify bone easily with an ultrasound just because of that bone shadow. Something that will really help you. Uh, again, you want to identify the, the pleural lining, the bone shadow, and that ESP, uh, longitudinal striations of that ES, ESP, or the erector spinae muscle. The one on the right I wanted to show because uh, I thought this was going to be a very easy block. You'll notice the transverse process is at two centimeters. This was a very thin patient, a uh, rib fracture patient, and uh, I thought this would be slam dunk. And I put the probe on and immediately realized this is going to be a very difficult block. He'd had a uh, chest tube placed and had, uh, for some reason, had a, a significant amount of subcutaneous air and emphysema um, under, just under his, his skin. And it caused a lot of artifact. And, and you'll notice all that air up in there uh, really uh, caused my ultrasound probe to not visualize the transverse process very well or the rectus spinae muscle very well. I was very disappointed uh, that I wasn't able to get a better uh, uh, picture here. Uh, but you still can do it. I was able to place this block and he did really well. But uh, just know that that is one of your complications or, or problems if you're, if you're going to uh, uh, do a, a patient, a ESP block on a patient that has posterior rib fractures. Uh, you may encounter some uh, subcutaneous air and you may also have uh, some significant edema and bleeding back there. You may want to uh, have both a uh, curvilinear and a linear probe in case you need to go a little bit deeper and, and get through some of that uh, tissue. Next slide, please. This is just a summary of, of what we talked about. Uh, we found that the ESP and the serratus block are uh, safer and easier blocks for our chest wall trauma as well as our, our surgical trauma uh, in, in surgery. Uh, again, it's a low concentration, high volume block we typically at least 20 mLs per injection site. Uh, if you're only doing one side uh, and say you're doing a, a breast, uh, unilateral breast reconstruction, I would probably inject 30 cc's of quarter percent bupivacaine and, um, and add a, uh, an additive or place a catheter uh, in, in that a T4, T5 uh, level. Uh, if you have multiple rib fractures or have, uh, you may need to inject uh, to, uh, two different levels. And again, the, the key here is to start laterally and move uh, your probe medially about two to three centimeters um, 
a paramedian, so a, a lateral to the spinous process until you see that flat uh, bony structure of the transverse process. You wanna peel that erector spinae muscle away from the transverse process. You wanna notice your depth uh, where that transverse process is. You wanna notice your needle, your muscles, and definitely identify the pleural lining uh, and, and so you can uh, avoid that and know how deep it is. I think that's all I have, Mark. Uh, um, uh, here's the, again, the uh, uh, poster that uh, Payank has put out uh, that for both, well, all four. It's the serratus plane is the top uh, uh, sec section. The uh, ESP block is the middle section, the paravertebral block, and the thoracic epidural, um, all for chest wall trauma. It's a very good uh, poster that uh, um, it can explain things uh, uh, very clearly. Thank you very much, Dr. Nelson. So um, we are going to go to our questions now. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that we can see the questions. Um, I made some notes of some questions whilst we were um, whilst we were doing the presentation. And um, I think the first question, uh, Dr. Nelson, that I'm going to ask you is um, when you place your ESP block, so um, from my point of view and, and for those that have joined us tonight, um, do you place this block preoperatively um, in the OR or in the block room um, or do you wait postoperatively to, to place this block? Oh, you're muted, Dr. Nelson, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I like to perform that these blocks in the uh, preoperative setting uh, for surgical uh, uh, multimodal analgesia reasons. Uh, you, can, you can block uh, a lot of the pain uh, pathway with, with these, uh, these cases. Uh, even in sternotomies, you, uh, you're going to anticoagulate uh, some of these patients uh, uh, during the surgery, and this would be a, a perfectly safe uh, block to do before or after. Uh, we've had um, surgeons not want to do it beforehand, and we've done it after, um, or, or most of them now are, are so comfortable with this and, and, and uh, have found that it be, it's, uh, doesn't take much time to do. Patients really tolerate it uh, pretty well too. A lot of blocks, um, they don't tolerate very well, um, uh, uh, like a tap lock, for instance, uh, pushing through that uh, abdominal wall can be kind of painful. This doesn't seem to have that same problem. Uh, we do this preoperatively all the time. But then the, the most, other most common reason to do this is uh, rib fractures in the ICU. Uh, and so. Uh, we'll, we'll go there and do that on, on intubated and unintubated patients. And if they're unintubated, not intubated, we'll actually have them lie to their side or, or sit up. Uh, and that seems to be tolerated pretty well. And another interesting question. Can the ESP block be used uh, for lower abdominal or even down as low as the hip? It has been uh, discussed and, and, sh and I've seen a few papers that have talked about that. Uh, I saw one that was a pediatric case for a femur fracture, and they used that in a very lower uh, portion of the uh, lumbar region. I think what you're doing in that case is that you're, you're trying to block the lumbar plexus uh, as it comes off. Uh, and, and so I think that's a site that uh, uh, options that uh, are still in, in uh, research and, and need to be looked into, but that is a promising uh, area whether you do an ESP block or a quadratus laborum block, uh, both of those blocks are, are, are promising to have. The benefit of having uh, abdominal uh, ESP blocks is that you're getting some visceral and, and, and somatic pain coverage uh, in that area. So where if you just did uh, tap blocks or rectus sheath blocks, you're not getting any visceral uh, coverage there, but an ESP block in the lower abdominal or even upper abdominal wall uh, will give you some uh, visceral uh, pain coverage too. Okay. 
Um, so there was a question about evidence related to ESB and serratus plane blocks uh, in in relation to paravertebral and um, and thoracic epidurals, and I think you know I will I will kind of start that off and say that there's evidence is starting to come out over the efficacy of these two blocks, and um, there's a large trial going ahead um, from a team in Coventry in the United Kingdom led by Dr. Hilleman that's looking at their um, uh, are at the spin eye plane blocks and pretty much they've gone away from doing um, the majority of their posterior blocks uh, and they're getting very very good results um, they will be publishing their data um, pretty soon but we could spend a lot of time talking about all of the evidence that's out there um, a quick google will give you a lot of the evidence obviously um, Rafa Blanco was the first person to describe this the um, latissimus um, uh, the serratus anterior block, sorry. Um, so there's, there's some good, good evidence and some good trials out there. So, but we won't sit and discuss every single piece of, of literature out there for, for these. Um, and Mark, may I make a comment on that too? Uh, these are fascial plane blocks. And so like any of your fascial plane block, you're not uh, identifying a, a specific nerve. You're not identifying the brachial plexus. You're not identifying uh, the femoral nerve or the popliteal sciatic uh, nerve. And those blocks uh, tend to be very efficient and very effective because you're actually seeing that nerve, you're bathing that nerve with the local anesthetic. You can almost get uh, you know complete coverage in a shoulder block with a, a good brachial plexus interscaling block. Fascial plane blocks, um, you, you're not identifying a specific nerve. So it's not going to be as reliable as, as some of these other blocks. It may not be as reliable as the thoracic epidural uh, and because the thoracic epidural, uh, you're getting good coverage, and but you're getting bilateral coverage. You're getting a lot of side effects of that thoracic epidural and, and restrictions of that thoracic epidural with um, anticoagulation that you don't have with the ESP block. Fascial plane blocks don't seem to be as reliable, but uh, that's why you use a high volume, low concentration. You're trying to cover as much of that fascial plane as possible, but they are, they do seem to be a safer block to place and a much easier block to place. And that's why I think they're becoming more popular in their usage um, and replacing paravertebral and, and thoracic epidurals. I would agree. So another one of the questions which was interesting, and it's kind of in a two part, um, was the duration of action um, for serratus anterior plane compared to the ESP. And again, from a serratus um, uh, anterior plane block, a single shot block in, in my experience has about 12 hours worth of duration, which is why an indwelling nerve catheter lends itself excellently for these nerve blocks. Now, if it's for complex um, chest trauma and rib flap fractures, your patient's going to be very happy for 12 hours, not so happy after that 12 hours. So by inserting a nerve catheter into these patients and um, would almost be the norm from my point of view, as opposed to just that single shot block for chest trauma. Uh, and again, uh, running that catheter on a bolus system as opposed to a basal flow rate. So remember, we keep reiterating these are large volume, low concentration. So you need large volume. So if you have to dilute your local anesthetic agent down, then that's what you need to do to keep within the guidelines for toxic volumes per kilograms of weight. So um, nerve catheters, we would then have uh, our team go around and either bolus them, or if you're privileged enough to have um, pumps that can give boluses every six hours, um, then giving a, a larger volume of that more concentrated local anaesthetic. But consistently, a single shot block would give you around 12 hours worth of um, anaesthesia. How about the ESP, Dr. Nelson? Yeah, I, um, I, we may have a little bit longer uh, um, time period of, uh, until it wears off. Uh, again, I like to add 20 mics of Presidex or, or dexmedetomidine uh, to the single injections. Um, catheters here work, uh, again, are, are a fantastic option. And we, we place several catheters in our, our multiple rib fractures. And you can even have uh, one, uh, one pump uh, y pieced into two different levels of the, those, those blocks. And, and you can get uh, multiple bays with those. 
the liposomal bupivacaine is an option uh, here too that will tend to get you two to three days worth of, uh, of a block. And, but you do have to dilute that down with a quarter percent bupivacaine is what I'd recommend. If you're going to do a single injection, I would definitely add, um, you know, some epinephrine or some dexmedetomidine uh, in order to prolong that block as long as possible. But uh, if you would ask me what my choice would be, it would be a, a catheter. Okay. So another, um, another question um, regarding the serratus block was whether or not you do a superficial or a deep serratus block. And there's certainly been some evidence um, going directly beneath latissimus dorsi and above serratus, I mean, going below serratus. And there's a few questions in there asking, you know, which one should we do? Well, um, all of my blocks I do as a superficial serratus nerve block. I think some of the evidence leads that the, um, the superficial um, gets uh, a longer duration of onset and the efficacy between the two, there's no difference in the e efficacy between a deep and a superficial block. Um, my rationale is why risk going deeper? Um, the deeper you are, the closer you are to pleura. Um, if you're using an out of plane technique and not necessarily seeing the tip of your needle, you're leaving yourself reasonably exposed. So I only ever do um, superficial serratus blocks um, and that they work fantastically well for my patient group. Yeah. Anything to add on that, Dr. Nelson? Yeah, I think if you're going deep to the serratus anterior muscle, you're doing more of an intercostal block and those tend to not last very long at all. Uh, and, and that's probably where you're getting a lot of that um, coverage. Uh, and, and for the ESP block, uh, I have heard of some people going above the erector spinae muscle as well, uh, but the majority of people now are going below the erector spinae muscle and above the transverse process. May I add on there that there are some uh, the new uh, research co coming out that looks at lower uh, lumbar uh, erector spinae blocks for uh, posterior spinal fusions. And I think that uh, is, is promising, uh, not necessarily because you're blocking the, the uh, spinal nerves that come out of the lumbar area, but you're blocking the, the dorsal rami uh, muscles and you actually numbing up the uh, erector spinae muscles and, and relaxing them because a lot of that pain in the lower back is from muscle spasm. And I suspect that's what it's, it's coming from. Uh, it's not being used r routinely at our, at our facility, but it, you know, I think it's a, an up and coming uh, option and, and more research will, will show if that's effective or not. Okay. Um, so another good question, do either of these blocks have a role in the context of chronic pain management? Yes, uh, they do. Uh, if, if you're having um, uh, chronic pain, uh, you, you can use these blocks as well. And uh, I'm not a chronic pain doctor, so I have not used it for chronic pain, but uh, my understanding is that uh, it, can be, it can be used uh, for, for chronic pain of the uh, chest wall and breast surgeries especially. Okay. Um, so there's a question about um, improving the um, corneal cradial spread with the local anesthetic here. Um, and somebody said that they find the plane easily, but uh, it seems easy to hydro dissect, but it rarely appears to spread more than a couple of rid spaces. And again, that could be, I don't know what volumes of local you're using, but again, the higher the volume, the more spread that you will get. So it's important to have that high volume, low concentration. Um, another thing that I really like to do as well is try and get my needle as posterior as I possibly can. So quite often um, when I'm scanning and looking for latissimus dorsi, I will actually have the the base of my probe, the heel of the probe, actually resting on the table, on the operating table or on the patient's bed um, and trying to insert my needle as far posterior. I find that I get much better cordial cradial spread um, and as well as posterior spread, which tends to give me, I think, a little bit better efficacy from my um, serratus anterior block. Yeah, um, and uh, uh, Mark, this is, a, again, a, both of them are a fascial plane block and you're attempting to get in that fascial plane. Uh, I don't, I have no idea whether it's worthwhile or not or if it works, but once I, I inject a large volume, I'll actually massage the area a little bit and try to spread that around that fascial plane a little bit. Uh, it's all anecdotal, but that's something I do I, 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 uh, just to see if I can spread that along that fascial plane. 
So just as a reminder, everybody, we've got a couple of minutes left and just scrolling through the Q&As and we'll try and get as many as we can done. Um, but I'm sorry to anybody that we can't answer your questions. We'll try and get, um, we'll try and get as many done as possible. Um, so somebody asked, you know, we keep saying that it's a high volume block and they use 30 cc's per side for an ESP block. Are you injecting more than that? And no, 30 cc's tends to be, um, tends to be my maximum uh, amount of local. And I will dilute that down to, um, you know, 0.25 or less, depending on the size of the patient. I've got no problem with diluting that down. And uh, as Dr. Nelson has said, um, adding some Presidex into that, again, improves the efficacy of that block. So that will always help if you're using a, a lower concentration. What concentration do you like, Dr. Nelson? Uh, yeah, it all depends on the number of rib fractures or, or the surgery. Um, if it's a single-sided uh, ESP block for, a, say, a unilateral mastectomy, uh, 20 to 25 cc seems to be at the T4, T5 level, seems to be um, sufficient. Uh, but if I have uh, multiple rib fractures on a, on a, on a, a, a you know, hefty guy, uh, I'll do 25 at the T4 level and then even 25 at the, uh, at the T, uh, T8 level in, in order to cover uh, T2 through T10. But I, I may add that that's, that's quarter percent pupivacaine. If you need a little more volume, and you're worried about local anesthetic toxicity, you have a little more leeway uh, and, and improved cardiotoxicity with ropivacaine. And you could use 0.2% ropivacaine and use a little higher volume uh, with that. Again, if you want to do that uh, as a single injection, you could add Presidex or um, even place catheters and, and run ropivacaine a, as a, an infusion for your, your catheter. And I would run 0.2% ropivacaine as a, as a, as a uh, catheter infusion. That's what I typically use. So there's been a few questions about um, citing these blocks in patients that are anticoagulated. Um, mm -hmm. And our, our, our thoughts on that, there was a question saying, do we go against the ASRA guide, the ASRA coagulation guidelines when we're doing um, especially um, ESP blocks? Um, somebody mentioned that the ESPs in principle are paravertible, which I would contest that, uh, you know, you yeah. need to go through the um, superior costal transverse ligament in order for it to be a paravertible block. So, I mean, as, as I said in my presentation, and I know you, Dr. Nelson, said the same, I actually, I, I will do um, a, a serratus anterior plane block in anticoagulated patients, being mindful of looking for those vessels. That's the most important part, using color Doppler, hydrodissecting around those vessels. Um, I'm more than happy to cite those blocks as a fascial plane block your yeah. thoughts and, and I, I feel the same way um, I, I think you may have some paravertebral uh, spread into the paravertebral space but you're not going you definitely don't want to go into the paravertebral space uh, with a fascial uh, with the ESP block and so I think it, it, you're okay doing uh, uh, it, this in a uh, in a um, anticoagulated patient my mind uh, mind you if uh, if they are very anticoagulated with an INR in, in the 10 or something like that, then I'd be very, very careful uh, and not to um, go too deep and, and make sure that I can see that very, that tip of that, um, that needle very carefully. But, um, you know, with a, a mildly anticoagulated patient, I think this is perfectly safe uh, and a block to do. Good. So we've had a few questions about nerve catheters uh, and I'm glad people are asking about nerve catheters and um, would you advocate inserting a nerve catheter in plane, out of plane, um, fixation methods? Um, some people yeah. saying that they don't have access to dedicated nerve catheters um, and is an epidural catheter sufficient to place into these fascial plane blocks? Uh, I do uh, like the the the, um, the nerve catheters. Uh, I like the, the the whole concept of a catheter over needle combination. Uh, I think those work the best. But uh, you can use an epidural, uh, uh, whether it be a two e or or whatever, uh, and place an epidural catheter in this area. You don't really know where that catheter is going, uh, and, and so that may not be as um, as efficient as uh, you know a catheter over needle technique 
Uh, I always use in plane. Uh, I just think in plane approach is is um, safer because you're you're watching that needle the entire way, uh, and um, I just find that as a, as a preference. I, I know people do out of plane uh, approaches, but I I just think the in plane approach is better for me. And and I would agree. So um, all of my catheters I insert in plane. Um, I also use a catheter over needle approach and you want to run that down that fascial plane. So you ideally want that running longitudinally down the fascial plane. Yeah. If you come out of plane and um, one, you don't know in which direction that that catheter is going to go, whether it's going to go cordial or, uh, cordial or cephalad. Um, so running across that and running it from an anterior to a posterior, especially in the uh, serratus anterior block, um, and I find that I use a slightly larger catheter than I would do a single shot needle. And that way then I can hydrodissect and insert my catheter um, as far posterior as I can get. And that alleviates any of those problems with that path catheter dislodging out of that plane if you try and run it down as far as you can. So, um, but, you know, if all of you've got is uh, epidural catheters, then by all means use those, try and feed that epidural catheter um, down, obviously, the, the the problem with it exiting out the end of the two needle and trying to run that down serratus rather than it flip uh, flip on itself but um, you know where there's a world there's a way and, and manipulation of the needle can make that move no. um, could you just reiterate how much um, presidex that you use um, Dr. Uh, 20 right? 20 to 30 mics per uh, uh, injection so if I'm doing uh, bilateral injections I'll use 20 mics uh, per side uh, but then usually no more than 40 mics a total. Okay, and that will prolong the duration of the block by approximately what time? Yeah, I think, it, I think you'll get two to six hours uh, uh, prolongation of, of that block, maybe even more, but uh, I like, I like Presidex better than um, clonidine or, or dex, uh, dexamethasone, and I even like it better than epinephrine, but uh, epinephrine is an option to, to prolong that block. So um, we are almost, uh, or we are at eight o'clock now. So mm -hmm. um, we're going to wrap this up. I want to thank everybody um, from around the world for joining us this evening. Thank you, Dr. Nelson, um, for your excellent You're presentation. Um, I hope this has, uh, has helped some of you either learning this block or certainly um, giving you a different block to do for patients that are going to benefit from this. Um, the presentation will be posted on the PyUnk website. Um, so if you would like to go to uh, the PyUnk website and, and revisit this presentation, you're more than welcome to. Um, remember, the posters can be requested um, via info at PyUnk. Um, so again, via the website, have a look on there. Um, on behalf of Azra and Payunk, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, this concludes today's program. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a pleasant evening. Thank you.